technical difficulties and I found why the volume was too low. All right, but, so we, we have officially started. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Public Safety Committee meeting for Wednesday, November 3rd, 2021. I'm Councilwoman Monica Rodriguez, Chair of Public Safety. Mr. Clerk, could you please call the roll? Uh, yes, uh, Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Buscaino. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. And Councilmember Coretz. Present. Very good. Three present, two absent. Thank you. And if you would please announce for uh, the call in information for today's meeting and uh, inform the members of the public who wish to speak on any of today's agenda items or process. Very good. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 161-586-7607 and then press the pound key. Press the pound key again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 and request to speak. Thank you so much. And so we will go ahead and take up public comment. Again, callers wishing to speak, please select star nine to raise your hand. And when it is your turn, Zoom will prompt you to select star six to unmute yourself. Okay, caller, if you please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Yes, all the items. In general, fucking public comment. Okay, you've got two minutes plus one minute for public comment. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> So, let's get to the last item. Apologize, Mr. t Fang. <laughs> yes, you need to apologize. And for that person that just sneezed, they would say, bless you. But in the words of Jeremiah Wright, fuck you. <laughs> now, we have the police permit review panel. <laughs> and why isn't Mr. t Fang doing his job? <laughs> what? what the hell are you talking about? Well, yeah, sir, I mean, in 2020, the person who resigned had a lapsed commission for a couple of months. That's what we mean. Just like in 2021, when Monica helped cover up for Nahatana this year. How many more of these scandals are there? How much more damage to the reputation of the LAPD commission will go on? No puppet calls for Mr. T. Frank's immediate resignation, apologies, and restitution. <laughs> oh, what about the five-year TRO? Yeah, that's right. Why did Mr. T. Frank get a five-year TRO and he couldn't do so? You can only get three years. Again, crime has a name. And the name is City Hall. Then we have all the other bullshit on the agenda. Now we'll get to our general public comment. <laughs> and then control it. Do I get my one minute? Or are you going to cheat me out of that? Uh, would you be able to locate that? Go ahead, one minute. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, good. No puppet found a clock. Over, so I don't know who, what As you know, <laughs> you are forcing firemen to lose their jobs and their pensions and careers. And police officers. For not taking a shot. A shot that does not work. Why does the mayor have COVID? If the shot works, why does Garcetti walk around with COVID? Coughing on you, sneezing on you, hugging you. Who knows who else he's given COVID to? My God, he might have given COVID to the president, for Christ's sake. Could you imagine if Kamala Harris assumed the duties of president? Oh, no. That's right. So remember, no shots, no suspensions for any LAPD officer. And if you want to go work for the sheriff or you want to go work in Florida, they will offer you bonuses. God bless our good cop. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, everything seems to be working. So I have a feeling that's operator error. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. My name is Margo Bennett, and I'm the executive director of Women Against Gun Violence, a nonprofit gun violence prevention organization 
serving L.A. and the state of California. I'm here. Cool. I'm here regarding agenda item one and one the ban on ghost guns. Okay, you have one minute. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, ghost guns are a serious threat to our Los Angeles communities, and we at Women Against Gun Violence strongly encourage you to vote in support of this ordinance and return it to the full council for consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Mm, can you hear me? I want to speak on. What item would you like to speak on? I want to speak on more items and general public comment, please. Go ahead. You have three minutes. Well, you heard the lady. She says she's afraid of ghost guns. Well, I live with the ghost, and it's never scared me. And besides, what do fucking women know about guns? The famous Annie Oakley knows about guns because she's fucking smart. She's a survivor. And not a holocaust like these dumb bitches calling in about item one. In regards to public safety on this commission, mm. Have you heard Monica? Monica Lewinsky thought Bill Clinton had a gun. So she went down to reach for it. Oops. Stick to the items Sorry. on the agenda. Well, I'm trying to explain. Can you not interrupt me? I only get just two minutes and one minute for non-agenda public comment. And besides, why doesn't that gentleman resign that we heard about earlier from the first speaker? Okay, we're going to take you to public comment. Go ahead. Okay. Well, why is it the faggot has COVID? Someone alleged he may have AIDS. Maybe if Glenn Dake would stop sticking his big hose up his ass for rage, Madam Chair, does this have anything to do with the oh, purpose you of this shut debate? Up, you no, fucking faggot. You fucking faggot. That's what you are. Why don't you... Okay. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hello, my name is Estella Suarez Hamilton. I'd like to speak on all available items and after general public comment, please. Okay, you've got uh, two minutes for the items and one minute for Thank you. I appreciate it. So item one, let me check the agenda. We're talking about the Board of Police Commissioners report relative to the impact of ghost guns. So for ghost guns, inventors and innovators, they have the right, you know, they have the right to be developing different kinds of new weapons, maybe even safer weapons, right? And we have the right to bear arms. So I think that you guys are infringing on the Constitution there. For item four, the Board of Police Commissioners report to Traffic Enforcement Program Grant. Obviously, just fluff, right? The second one, the third one is fluff as well, I think. And I think the sixth one is fluff. You guys are just adding these agenda items to bulk up your agendas and add some kind of legitimacy. Okay, so now item seven, we have prohibiting the sale of bicycle parts. You know, you guys have been attacking and attacking poor people for so long that you just don't even, you don't even hide the fact that you're targeting a very specific population. Who is selling the bicycle parts? Obviously, people just trying to get by. If they don't have opportunity, now you're criminalizing the only opportunity that they have. Think about other countries where we have like little pop-up markets and stuff, right? If you don't want that, you've got to provide opportunity for people. And that doesn't start with criminalization. Okay, now I've gotten my bike stolen. I understand it fucking sucks. I know it sucks. But the people that are stealing the bikes, the people that are participating in these different kinds of markets, that is because of you people 
and you people participate in the ugliest kind of black market. <laughs> Hashtag PizzaGate. Hashtag QAnon, whatever the fuck you guys want to call me. Now, moving on to item 13, you guys are talking about the Public Benefits Trust Fund. How about you use that money for public benefits instead of benefiting y'all so, all right? Now, moving on to my general public comment, I would like to speak about the fact that in the past meeting, I've been trying to quote the Bible, and in this meeting now, also... We have people who are able to express themselves, right? I would like to be able to express myself quoting the Bible fully without you guys cutting me off, without you guys questioning my relevancy. It is, you're overstepping boundaries. My religious freedom, my freedom to expression includes quoting the Bible. And if you don't understand the context, that's your problem. All right? If you don't understand the context, that's your problem. You let me speak for my two minutes. If I spend the time to call and listen to your bullshit, you need to listen to my bullshit. That's why I pay taxes. That's why you get paid. Hello, council members. My name is Lily Kinnear. Um, I'm a member of Team and Up, which is a youth-led um, uh, gun advocacy group. Um, I'm calling about the first item on the agenda. Okay, you've got one minute for it. Okay. Um, ghost guns pose a particular problem as they allow the purchaser to circumvent nearly all restrictions and regulations on purchasing a gun. Um, California has some of the strongest gun laws in the country, yet in the face of ghost guns, the work of activists and concerned citizen citizens is destroyed. Everyone from criminals to young teenagers can purchase a gun without background checks. Um, actually, one of my teammates who works on our uh, ghost gun advocacy or our gun advocacy group, um, Stephen Abrams, thought to purchase one of these guns when he was only 17 for an experimental video. His purchase was fully legal, yet bypassed numerous laws that would have otherwise prevented him from purchasing a gun. These ghost gun kits include all of the parts and often the tools necessary to build these weapons at home and are widely available and can be purchased by anyone, including prohibited purchasers, domestic abusers, and gun traffickers without a background check. They can also be mought by minors as his experience is true. This is why local action is critical in preventing the sale of ghost guns, and we need to pass this first item on the agenda. Um, this issue will only continue to get worse, and as we've seen recently, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of ghost guns that the LAPD has um, recouped, and it becomes even more pressing. And Thank you. Councilwoman, I think you're muted. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Jonah, and I'd like to speak on agenda item one. Okay, you have one minute. Go ahead. Well, yes, as I kind of said, my name is Jonah, and I'm a high school student here in Los Angeles. And like Lily, who just spoke, I'm here to speak today on behalf of Team Enough, which is a youth arm of the Brady campaign. As a member of Team Enough, I've been lucky enough to have had the opportunity to advocate and pass numerous gun violence prevention bills, and knowing that my team's work has helped make California safer is the greatest feeling in the world. We're lucky to live in the state with the strongest gun laws in the country. However, ghost guns jeopardize all of the progress the state of California has made. While they run rampant, nearly every piece of life-saving firearm legislation becomes obsolete. They bypass nearly every provision and make deadly firearms available to everyone. Just like Lily said, Stephen Abrams, at age 17, was able to purchase a ghost gun and have a firearm from the state of California because uh, there was no action against it. And as a high school student, it's deeply concerning to know that anybody at my school can access a firearm so easily. Other cities like San Diego and San Francisco have already taken great strides in their efforts to, co uh, to curb the ghost gun epidemic, and now Los Angeles has a chance to follow in their footsteps. 
on behalf of Team Enough and the youth in Los Angeles that are threatened. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Hi, caller, please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Monica, you fat cow bitch! <laughs> bitch! Bitch! Hmm. Already spoke. My name is Suzanne Burge. I'm president of the Los Angeles chapter of Brady United to prevent gun violence, and I would like to speak on agenda item number one. We urge the Public Safety Committee to take action and to ban the ghost guns, and we just want to ensure that any such ordinance is enforced equitably and without targeting or harming communities already bearing the brunt of gun violence. And thank you for being public servants. Thank you so much for calling. That concludes general public comment. Colleagues uh, would like to uh, recommend that we take items three through six and eight through 14 on consent. Are there any objections? Madam Chair, what was that last? Mr. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Okay, uh, just one point of clarification. That was uh, what through 14? Madam. Uh, Madam Hello? Okay, um, yes, on the second set, that was 8 through 14, or did I miss here? Correct. Three, okay. three, through, 3 through 6 and 8 through 14. Very good. I'll call the roll. Council Member Rodriguez? Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Buscano? <laughs> Council Member Harris Dawson? Yes. And Council Member Coretz? Aye. Very good. Those are all approved. Thank you so much. And now that will bring us to item number one on today's agenda. Item number one, Board of Police Commissioners report relative to the impact of ghost guns in the city and city attorney report and ordinance amending the Los Angeles Municipal Code to prohibit the possession, purchase, sale, receipt, or transport of a non-serialized unfinished firearm frame or receiver or non-serialized firearm subject to certain exceptions. Thank you. And Mr. Peretz, uh, since this is your item, I uh, invite you to please uh, pick us off. Thank you, Madam President, um, or Madam Chair, I should say. Uh, colleagues, in 2013, a mass shooting near Santa Monica City College took the lives of six people and injured four more. In 2014, there was a bank robbery in Stockton. A 2017 shooting spree in rural Tahama County killed six. In 2019, a 16-year-old killed two students, injured three others, and killed themselves at a school in Santa Clarita. And last year, during the protest over police violence. Uh, Stephen Carrillo used a machine gun to shoot two security guards at a federal building in Oakland and a sheriff's deputy in an ambush at Santa Cruz. Um, the common thread running through each of these tragedies that they, is that they were carried out with ghost guns, but the prevalence of ghost guns on our streets isn't somebody else's problem. It's an issue we continue to grapple with in LA. And we obviously have an increase in homicides. Between January through June of 2019, we saw a 35% increase compared to the same period of 2021. And earlier in the year, the LAPD recovered more than 700 ghost guns that used parts from Polymer 80, a Nevada-based manufacturer currently being sued by the city of LA. Uh, about 300 of those were found in the South Los Angeles area. And last year, the ATF LA Field Division said that 41% of their cases were turning up ghost guns. And last month, during an announcement of a new federal strike force focused on disrupting the illegal flow of weapons into Los Angeles and the sale of ghost guns locally, 
Chief Morris said these guns now account for a third of all weapons recovered by the department. The department has seen a 400% increase in ghost gun recoveries since 2017, and current trends show these figures will continue to grow exponentially. So put simply, ghost guns are replacing firearms that people would normally purchase with no background checks required. These ghost gun kits that allow them to be put together cost four to $500, come in cardboard boxes containing steel barrels, plastic frames, and a number of small plastic and metal parts. But because the parts aren't finished guns, they mostly escape California's and federal uh, gun control laws. So the guns once assembled have no serial numbers because they're sold as unfinished kits. They're exempt from background checks and waiting periods. There's no federal restrictions on who can buy ghost gun kits, how many kits or parts someone could purchase, and they're intentionally marketed as unregulated and untraceable to appeal to people prohibited from purchasing their firearms legally. They're not marketed to law-abiding hobbyists or citizens who are going to take a stroll to their friendly neighborhood federally licensed firearms dealer to pick up a ghost gun kit. They're marketed to people who would otherwise be prohibited from purchasing or possessing firearms. And it's ridiculous to think that the manufacturer's sale and marketing of these weapons is intended for anything but skirting the loophole in state and federal gun laws to get firearms into the hands of people who law enforcement and society in general have deemed unfit to possess these guns. They have no place in Los Angeles. They've already wrecked havoc on our streets. And we have an obligation to protect the lives of all Angelinos. And this is one step that we can take to do that. So I ask for all of your support. Um, I do have uh, a couple questions, though, um, if I might. First, go ahead. Uh, first, I, I wonder if LAPD could provide a, a brief overview of the commission report that, that's before us currently. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're prepared to do that. Uh, I'm uh, Deputy Chief Chris Pitcher, and I'm joined with uh, the officer in charge of the gun unit, Detective Ben Maida. And so, as you know, why we're here is ghost guns have become a very prolific problem for the city of Los Angeles and its residents. To date, LAPD has recovered a total of 7,489 guns with two months left to go in the year. All last year, the department recovered a total of 6,536 guns. Of that, the department has recovered uh, 1,637 ghost guns, as opposed to the 2020 total yearly uh, total of 813 ghost guns. We expect by the end of the year to eclipse over 2,000 ghost guns recovered. So as you can see, the problem is, is bad and it's getting worse. And as you, you know, just to give you a little bit of specificity, ghost guns are involved in numerous acts of violent crimes. Just to kind of give you a context here, very specifically, we have recovered ghost guns in the following crimes just this year alone. In 14 murders, in four carjacks, in nine spousal assaults, we have recovered ghost guns from 195 felons who are in possessions of them, from 15 robberies. We have recovered 65 ghost guns from suspects involved in narcotic sales and transportation incidents. We have taken two ghost guns from child molestation suspects. We've taken 50 ghost guns from assaults with deadly weapon suspects. 11 ghost guns have been used in shots fired in an inhabited dwelling. We have had nine taken from minors, nine ghost guns taken from minors out in the streets. We had 61 taken, they were assault weapons um, in possession by people in the public. 10 ghost guns from individuals arrested for criminal threats. We had 138 ghost guns taken from, they were concealed on people in public places or in vehicles. We had 96 
ghost guns that were taken out of vehicles involved in crimes. And so as you can see, there is a mass problem with ghost guns and it grows exponentially by the month. In 2021, there have been 32 officer involved shootings. And in those 32 officer involved shootings, 13 involved firearms. And of those, six were ghost guns uh, used against officers. To further that, uh, as you are all aware, about three weeks ago, we had a Newton officer shot as he was coming to work just outside of the station. During that incident, the individual, the 14-year-old gang member that was arrested, was arrested with a ghost gun that had a very large capacity magazine attached to it. So we're seeing these ghost guns popping up all over the place. And I'm going to have Detective Mehta walk you through a little bit about what ghost guns are, some of the legislation, and some of the enforcement efforts. Ben? Uh, good evening, Councilman. Direct Kelly, how are you doing, everyone else? Uh, I wanted to emphasize, thank you, uh, Councilman Peretz, for filling most of my uh, presentation there. I appreciate I'll cut some time off of this because the, what we do want to emphasize is that these ghost guns do only, only take about 30 to three hours to make with minimal tools, okay? We used to say, where are the bad guys that are making these ghost guns? Now we say, who is not making ghost guns? Because just about everyone is joining in. Um, the thing is that these, yes, they're not regulated background checks. Nobody has to sign any uh, report receipts or leave any information when they buy these kits and they take them home to build these firearms. They build these firearms that have the capacity to accept a 30 round magazine. It's a concealable weapon, copy of the Glock uh, P80 polymer that we're currently that we're currently suing is still the number one. And um, then, like I said, these account for over 60 percent of the crime guns that are recovered versus the assault weapons that are under 10 percent, under anywhere between six and 10 percent. Uh, anyway, so what I also wanted to add is that we are running crazy trying to train patrol officers in the identification of these uh, firearms, of uh, the manufacturers and traffickers, so we can start targeting that uh, versus the possessors that are currently uh, mandated uh, uh, to, to serve a misdemeanor under state law if you are a manufacturer or if you um, admit to ownership, which our, our current legislation uh, with uh, Sarai Kelly that drafted up that ordinance is going to help in possession and the, the kits that are unserialized, which is outstanding. But uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, this enforcement is, uh, like I said, this enforcement is uh, being uh, uh, spread out throughout the city. And we currently made a guideline to standardize the LAPD and identifying these traffickers and manufacturers. Um, I just came from a search warrant today in the Valley. We just got another guy that was uh, selling tar heroin and making ghost guns. And this is a weekly event. We have uh, Metro CIT performing this job. We have the Valley ATF units. We have the GND gun unit. We have the violent crime impact unit out of West Bureau handling and it's non-stop and continues to be out of control. Um, we are getting ghost guns on gun buybacks and now we are seeing the 3D printers are starting to evolve where we just currently, if uh, you read the news, Newton picked up a 3D printer where this uh, gentleman was now not buying the kits and not buying the parts at a gun store or through the internet, but just making them at home with uh, filament and, and just something that, that you know, he, he working out of his own little tattoo shop. Uh, yes, Councilman Corrette says we are at 400% since 2017. The numbers are gonna continue to grow, okay? So with this current legislation that is being drafted by the city of LA, uh, following uh, San Diego and San Francisco, we will have to be extremely serious in the prosecution because the bad guys, it's the, the weapon of choice right now. But what worries the department is that our citizens 
will make it a weapon of their choice. And if we don't start enforcing it and be serious about this, then the numbers are going to grow so much that our bad guys are going to be buying them, our community is going to be buying them, and when the communities are tired of these firearms, they're going to start to sell them with no accountability to anybody, including minors, including prohibited per persons, including persons with mental health issues, and anybody, because like I said, there's no accountability. So we need to be serious about this. Um, otherwise, we will lose control as we are seeing now. And I wonder if we could ask the city attorney to walk us through the actual ordinance and any concerns that we have in the process. Yes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Council Members. I'm Deputy City Attorney Soraya Kelly, and I'll give you a brief overview of the draft ghost gun ordinance that my office prepared and transmitted. Um, so the draft ordinance uh, contains the following prohibitions. Subsection B1 of the ordinance prohibits the possession, receipt, or transport of a non-serialized unfinished frame or unfinished receiver. Subsection B2 prohibits the sale, transfer, offer to transfer, or purchase of a non-serialized unfinished frame or unfinished receiver. Uh, subsections B3 and B4 deal with non-serialized firearms. Specifically, uh, subsection B3 prohibits the possession, receipt, or transport of a non-serialized firearm. And subsection B4 prohibits the sale, transfer, offer to transfer, or purchase of a non-serialized firearm. And a violation of the ordinance is uh, a misdemeanor punishable by a fine of up to 1,000 or imprisonment for up to six months or both. Um, do note that the draft ordinance contains certain exceptions. Uh, so for example, the prohibitions do not apply to certain specified persons or entities that are named in the ordinance, such as a licensed fire, federal firearms importer or a licensed federal firearms manufacturer. Similarly, the provisions of the ordinance relating to unfinished frames and unfinished receivers don't apply to firearm precursor parts vendors that are or will be licensed under California law to sell such parts, nor do the provisions apply to lawful transactions that are processed by such vendors under California law. Um, finally, the draft ordinance contains provisions to encourage persons that are currently in possession uh, of such parts to voluntarily surrender non-serialized firearms, unfinished frames, and unfinished receivers to law enforcement. So, for example, a person in possession who willingly surrenders such items to a law enforcement agency or agent will not be penalized under subsections B1 and B3. Uh, and similar, similarly, a person who is found to be in possession of two or fewer non-complying parts shall not be penalized under subsections B1 and B3 if they surrender the items and they do not commit any further violations within the following year. So what's the reason for the exceptions? The, the reason of the initial exceptions, uh, the reason for the exceptions, we drafted the, the ordinance so that it would be as defensible as, 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 it, as it can be. And it basically just brings our ordinance uh, consistent with and, and streamlines it along with state law and federal law. Okay. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I've got. That's Mr. Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, Chief, thanks for the presentation. You know, I just want to go over one of the things that they just brought up, then that was the penalty uh, point that was picked up, just uh, explained to us. So obviously when you're, you're finding, uh, well, at least I think that when you're finding these in possession of people, uh, in people's possession, they're not necessarily your average gun owner. These are people who can't legally have guns. Am I correct? Well, that happens sometimes, but not, not in all instances. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, or may not know, the possession of a ghost gun by itself without any other prohibitions, i.e. not illegally concealed on the person and or in the vehicle, is legal. There is no uh, issue to possess a gun 
that has no serial number that cannot be traced. Um, and that is the issue. So it's, it's not always found in the hands of those that, that are not legally allowed to possess that. It is found in the possession of people in businesses, in uh, you know, their, their, their homes, whatnot, where we come across you know, other um, calls for service uh, and we will find that type of weapon. We can confiscate the weapon, but we cannot make an arrest under current law. Okay, so okay, so if we pass this, then I'm assuming that the law-abiding people aren't going to be, you know, ordering these ghost guns at people that who cannot possess these guns. So I just don't understand why, in the penalty phase, or maybe this is a question for the city attorney's office, is if a person who possesses, transports, or receives two or fewer non-serialized firearms, unfinished frames, or unfinished receivers in violation of subsection B1 and B3 shall not be penalized for a first time offense if the person surrenders such items i don't i don't understand what that means surrender such items i mean if they're caught aren't we are we confiscating the items so one one for example one one scenario where someone could surrender such items would be if for example there were some sort of uh, like a, a precursor part buyback program or something to that effect, or if someone were to willingly take their parts to law enforcement and surrender them. Okay, but I mean, if they had a hundred ghost guns and they, you know, wouldn't we want them to surrender all hundred of these ghost guns? I, so that's the instance. So it's only an instance when somebody is surrendering them to us. But if, if we find someone in possession on a first time offense, Okay, then it's still, we can still go after them, right? I mean, they're still in violation of this. This is, this is not something where first time offense that they get some layoff. So this is only for gun buybacks or if someone voluntarily walks into the police station and says, here, I have ghost guns, here you go. So, so if, if, to answer that question, if someone uh, has three or more parts, uh, non-compliant parts, and they were found in violation, uh, then they, they wouldn't have the opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to, to sort of to reduce that or to, to, to not have that not be charged. If someone uh, was found to be in possession of two or fewer non-compliant parts, if they surrendered, willingly surrendered that and did not commit any more violations, there would be opportunities for those persons to, um, you know, to not have that, that, that it charged as a, as a violation. If they did not have any further, uh, if they didn't have any further uh, violations of this provision within that same year. Okay, so it says here that two or fewer, well, what's included in here doesn't say that, it doesn't say just the two or four parts. It also includes two or fewer non-serialized firearms. So by this, the way it's written, if someone has two completed ghost guns, and that we get them on the first time offense, we are not going to prosecute them? Yeah, yeah. If, if they have two or fewer items that are, that are non-serialized, including firearms, then it, so long as they did not, they surrendered those, par, those either firearms or parts and did not commit an offense within that same year, then uh, yes, there, there would be, uh, they, they would not be penalized. I don't, uh, Chief. I mean, don't you don't you don't you have a problem? Don't you see a, a, a problem with that? I mean, I understand if, if someone is caught with two or few parts, but the way the ordinance is written, it says two or fewer non-serialized firearms, unfinished frames or unfinished receivers. So, if they're actual firearms that are all put together, but it's two or fewer, they will not be charged. Um, yes, I'm so sorry. The detective made a, a, just a question to our city deputy city attorney. My understanding was that the actual possession of the ghost gun, whether it was one or two or three, was the actual violation. So therefore, the completed ghost one was the violation. Is that correct? So the, the possession would be a violation, but if the, if, if the violator... Uh, surrenders those parts and does not commit another violation 
within the same year, then they would essentially get a, a, a grace or it wouldn't be charged. Cor correct. So oh. that, well, that's the catch, that if the violator surrenders those parts, but if we come across that violator, then the violation is that they did not surrender it and therefore the violation stands. That was my understanding. And therefore we could charge them with that misdemeanor ordinance. Ms. Kelly, is that how you see it? Like, I understand if someone surrenders it, but if we come into, if we find someone and they're in possession of two of these firearms, we are still under this ordinance, the way it's written, still allowed to charge them. So un I, under this ordin ordinance, we would be allowed to charge them. However, if they uh, do not commit any additional violations within that first year, uh, they, they, they would have basically a year grace period to not be charged with that first violation. Okay, so why are we giving them a pass on the first time offense? These are ghost guns. These are, there's no reason for them to possess these guns. Why would we, why would we be giving them a pass on their first? Is this something that you requested? Is this come, is this a is this direction that you got from the council? Definitely not from us. Yeah, the, these these uh, provisions were uh, were based on on similar ordinances that were that that can you know that, and model ordinances that contain these provisions. Well, colleagues, I see no reason to, to I mean to include this in in this this yeah. this is. This seems ridiculous that we're not that we're giving a pass on first time offenses of carrying boost guns well, if they have two or fewer. I'm uh, trying to I understand this, one. Kelly, I, and I appreciate John. I appreciate your line of questioning because I, I just want to make sure that we're crystal clear. The acquisition of a ghost gun is to circumvent any legalized possession of firearms. So there's no reason I, I'm trying to ask, I'm trying to really reconcile here what he what he why why it's kind of proposed in this way. I, I'm not understanding what what I, I understand you derived this from a San Diego model, uh, and, but I and I'm just I want to make sure that everyone is really crystal clear because again the the intent and in possession uh, of this type of firearm is uh, the intent to circumvent any legalized acquisition of this uh, of this of this item. So uh, I just want to make sure that we're, we're all on the same page. Because I yeah. think the council has been very, I think it, seems, it appears, I think you get the word from the council members here in particular, uh, we got a problem. Yeah, so I, I think the, the idea behind this type of provision is, you know, for persons that are not prohibited persons that may have acquired these parts at a time when it was legal to do so, it would just give them additional time. It wouldn't, you know, penalize them or criminalize them for a conduct that they uh, it participated in when it was legal to do so. Um, and again, it would only apply for, you know, it wouldn't apply to people that have a business of trafficking in these parts or firearms who may have three or more or a hundred of these parts. It would only be for people that are in possession of two or fewer items. And it would not apply to people who are selling or purchasing or transferring the firearms. So when you say parts, are you talking about the incompleted items? Yeah. Yeah, when I'm yeah, when I'm talking about parts, I'm referring both to unfinished firearm frames, uh, unfinished firearm uh, receivers, and and the non-serialized uh, firearms. So so all of those three types of uh, components. Yeah, so it's a complete right, complete gun. I, there's a 90 day grace period written in here that says. Yeah, I mean, a 90 period for those people who are in possession of these things to give up, to give up those. So if after 90 days, I, I don't, I don't see the reason. I mean, Madam Chair, I, I move that we strike this from the, from the, this one from the ordinance, unless the chief uh, sees some reason or the detective, some reason we should keep this in them. Uh, chief or detective, I mean, is there a reason why you think that this would be necessary in it, I mean, as far as buybacks or guns, I would I would think that if someone walks into a station and they have a hundred of these those guns, we're not going to charge them. We 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 want that. We want you know whether you have one, two, a hundred, you know that you turn these in. So, but 
Chief, I, you know, I'm, I'd like your, or Detective, I apologize, Detective, if, if you have a, something to say about this, if you have an issue with me striking this from the, from the yes, ordinance. So we, we agreed that the 90 day grace period uh, was good and it was fair, uh, but we definitely uh, do want compliance and prosecution uh, as soon as that 90 day window is closed on any possession of these uh, kits or frames or, or gun parts. We want to discourage anybody from bypassing the, uh, the background checks. Anybody that qualifies for a firearm can go to a gun dealer, and there's plenty here in Southern California. And if they're not prohibited, if they don't have any restraining orders, if they don't have any other prohibitions, then they can legally obtain a firearm through a dealer. Um, there's no violation of the Second Amendment right there. But we, we want to uh, be firm on everything. And like I said, after the 90-day period, then we should be able to enforce it on uh, one, two, three, four, or whatever, because we've given them that time to surrender these parts. Thank you, Detective. So, Madam Chair, I'd like I'd uh, move that we strike um, their uh, strike. However, the part of the penalty section that says, however, if a person who possesses transports or receives two or fewer non-serialized firearms, unfinished frames, or unfinished receivers in violations of subsection B, one and B3 of this section shall not be penalized for a first time offense if the person surrenders such items to law enforcement and does not commit additional violations of this section in the year following the violation. Second. Uh, my, my only question, otherwise I would, I would happily second that is, will that delay the ordinance with the city attorney to need to do further work or can we just amend that section out? Uh, I think that we can, it would be relatively quick and easy to amend that section out. We could uh, probably transmit another uh, similar, you know, the same ordinance with, with that uh, sentence uh, gone uh, or stricken within uh, this week, I would imagine. Well, I, I certainly would, would support that thought and, and uh, appreciate Council Member Lee uh, uh, catching that. I think that's, that's a a weakness in the ordinance that we didn't need to, to add. So, so thank you. Perfect. Any other questions, colleagues? Uh, uh, just so I'm clear um, on this, because uh, it's uh, quite, quite complica complicated, uh, and I appreciate uh, Councilman Lee uh, digging into the details of it. So there are two parts of this, I think. There's the one part if they, if people have parts of these guns that are not together, that's one category of things. But then if people have parts of these guns that they turn in, that they surrender, that's another, that's treated a different way. Uh, I think that's what Councilman Lee is trying to get at. So we won't say, oh, well, you only have parts, so you're not in trouble. Um, we wanna, if we catch you and you're doing something and you have parts, that counts like it would uh, at any stage. but. I just want to make sure we're separating that from people who are surrendering uh, things like at a buyback or something else. Yes. Yeah, so, so there, so people who are, who voluntarily uh, relinquish or, or surrender parts at a buyback uh, would not be penalized under the ordinance. Thank you. And that's in its current, in its proposed current form that we intend to uh, finalize. Correct. Were there any other questions, Mr. Busfano? I'm good. No? And I support the amendment. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Um, that being said, uh, see, John, did you have another question or? Oh, you're good. Okay, thank you. Um, so seeing no other questions, I think we'd like to go ahead and recommend that we adopt the draft ordinance as amended. And uh, Mr. Clerk, if you would please call the roll. Yes, Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. Councilmember Buscaino. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. And Councilmember Coretz. Aye. 
Very good. Approved as amended. Thank you very much. And uh, that'll now bring us, I know, uh, Mr. Buscaino, I want to go ahead and give you an opportunity on item number seven, if we can go ahead and call item seven. Very good. Item seven, motion Buscano Lee relative to prohibiting the assembly, disassembly, sale, offer of sale, distribution of bicycles and bicycle parts on public property or within the public right of way, model after a similar ordinance in the city of Long Beach. This matter has also been referred to the Public Works Committee. Go ahead, Mr. Buscano. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate you scheduling this today. Um, members in my district, we've seen a proliferation of, of bike shop, shop shops. Uh, informal operations where, where bikes are disassembled, parts are sold or traded on sidewalks and other public spaces. I'm not only seeing this here in Council District 15, but other corners of the city most recently, I believe in Koreatown. This, um, you may have seen it on the news. This huge operation to the point where it's become a public health, public safety issue. Um, most often these bikes are stolen quickly disassembled and sold for parts. Unlike motor vehicles, uh, where we have VIN numbers that are placed uh, in multiple locations, serial numbers on bikes are usually only in one location and are much easier to file off um, based on what I've seen in my, my, my time working on the streets uh, as a police officer. Furthermore, uh, most bicycle owners don't keep documentation of the serial number which makes it difficult for police officers to prove a specific bicycle that matches the description of one report is stolen is in fact the same bike. Uh, we have learned from our neighbors in Long Beach, uh, they've taken a, a, a novel approach in addressing this problem. We, I know Dennis Gleason, my ledge director, has worked with them to get more feedback and input uh, from their city attorney's office in making it a criminal offense to operate bike shops bike chop shops in public areas. Um, so the Long Beach ordinance describes a chop shop as three or more bikes, uh, a bicycle frame with uh, gear cables or bike uh, or brake cables cut, uh, two or more bicycles with missing parts or five or more bicycle parts. So I believe this ordinance will give LAPD necessary tool to reduce bike theft and help clean up our streets. Uh, just had a question um, for the city attorney. Um, kind of want to lead with uh, quickly on this want to know how long it will take to transmit the draft ordinance hi i'm sorry is, is that a question for me or is there another a, another city attorney that was specifically um uh, on on the call to to speak as to this item mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if yeah. Just want to know the turnaround and how quick we can get this back to us. I know it's um, got to be our committee, but love yeah, um, you know, I'm I'm not certain who's working on it or if someone has already started working on it, but we can definitely. Um, I mean, it shouldn't be too long of a turnaround time, and we can certainly give you an update uh, once I know who has been assigned to work on this ordinance. Okay, <laughs> not the answer I was looking for, hopefully, but understood. Uh, we'll uh, just wait to, uh, to get this. Do we know, Mr. Mr. Clerk, when it's gonna get scheduled in Public, uh, public Works? Um, I have no idea what sure. their sure. schedule's we'll, like. We'll check with the chair, thank you. Yeah. Ask for your support, members. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. And uh, go ahead and recommend the adoption. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please call the vote. Yes, uh, Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. Council Member Aye. Council Member Harris Dawson. No. And Council Member Koretz. Aye. Very good. This matter is approved and will be forwarded to the Public Works Committee. Thank you. And now that brings us to Item number two on today's agenda. Very good. Item two, Los Angeles Fire Department report in response to motion, Rodriguez Harris Dawson, relative to a review of the grievance and the disciplinary process within the Los Angeles Fire Department for behavioral, discriminatory, and retaliatory complaints, including record keeping of complaints as categorized by gender or ethnicity. Thank you so much. And I know we have uh, 
Chief Everett with us. So uh, Chief, uh, colleagues, uh, you're very well familiar with some of the more publicly documented uh, assertions that have been made about the department. This motion is in response to helping to uh, reflect on uh, the data of the complaints, uh, the sources of those complaints and what the uh, investigative process and uh, the uh, punishment associated with those claims uh, have been uh, as a result. So Mr. Uh, so Chief Everett, if you could go ahead and kind of give us an overview on this. Absolutely, good afternoon, Madam Chair and honorable committee members, Graham Everett, Deputy Chief. I serve as the Chief of Staff. Uh, the report that was submitted to you provides an overview of professional standards division and um, uh, we have some statistics associated with that as well that we can get into a little bit. I'm going to um, kind of give you an overview of the division itself, the work that they do, uh, the process of, of investigations that we conduct, and then uh, some information about the statistical information that we were able to gather. Um, the professional standards division was was brought to the department. We, we created the uh, division in January of 2008. It was as a result of a, a controller's audit back then. And um, the division is headed by a uh, assistant chief. It's assistant chief uh, Christina Kepner. And we have a um, chief special investigator that's a civilian employee and Cynthia Hernandez. And she's actually a lawyer, but she does not serve as our legal counsel. We rely on the city attorney's office for that. With me today from the city attorney's office is Erica Johnson Brooks, who serves, who works with us basically every day. And I think Phyllis Henderson is also on the line as well for any questions specifically on labor relations uh, for the city attorney's office. Um, so in addition to uh, the command staff there, we have a battalion chief that uh, conducts, is basically internal affairs section chief. And I served in that capacity for three years, starting from 2008 to 2011 which kind of brought me to the foundation of understanding um, much more about administrative discipline procedures. Um, in addition to the command staff, we have five sworn positions there that are captains. They serve as advocates. And we have 10 authorities there for civilian investigators. Our civilian investigators are essential for that position because our special duty or administrative duty assignments for sworn usually rotate out every two years. And the complexity is of these investigations and understanding the charter the Bill of Rights, the MOUs um, associated with doing investigations gets kind of complex. So it's good that we have staff that remains there um, and our civilian employees uh, have that expertise. The majority of our civilian employees have background in investigations either from former with law enforcement as detectives or something like that, and also from the state bar and other agencies that conduct investigations basically full time. So we have professionals that do these investigations with different backgrounds from all different agencies. Um, the basic functions of PSD, they, they conduct the investigations. Um, we provide the disciplinary process as, as required in the charter and under the guides of um, the Bill of Rights state law. And um, they also conduct the Board of Rights hearings and potentially civil service hearings, uh, depending on the case. So in the report, um, we kind of lay out how the process works. And if you take it from a complaint all the way through, uh, we have a system called the complaint tracking system, which is basically a database. It tracks the complaints as they come into the, into the division. Um, we accept all complaints. Uh, we encourage our members and the public that if they have a complaint about anything that goes on with the department member about performance, or, um, or any kind of uh, uh, EEO related complaint or an assault or anything. Uh, we take that complaint into the complaint tracking system and it's processed within PSD and they do the investigations. There are cases that are minor in nature that are identified in the workbook that are sent back to the field for investigation by the supervisor of the employee, depending on what the nature of it is. PSD maintains the investigations that are more complex um, and typically everything that's uh, off duty, uh, uh, illegal, con you know, uh, offenses, off duty misconduct, um, and possibly criminal cases, those remain at PSD. Um, professional standards division, we are only capable of doing administrative investigations. Um, if we have a situation and our policy is, if it involves a criminal action, 
uh, we make a quick referral to the law enforcement agency that's responsible for that jurisdiction. So oftentimes we work with LAPD and other law enforcement agencies and they conduct the criminal investigation. But to make sure that we don't taint that investigation, we have a separate wall between the admin investigation and the criminal and we have a criminal liaison that works with the law enforcement agency to get what they need um, as required. So we have different statutes and a different process than a criminal side. It's um, our burden of proof is different than a criminal court. For instance, our burden of proof for administrative cases is a uh, preponderance of evidence. So as we do our investigations, if it's more likely than not that it occurred, then we can move forward with the case. Um, so once the complaint is received, we conduct the investigation, that report, we do the in interrogations, we do the interviews with the witnesses, evidence collection, um, and we will provide that report to the battalion chief assigned to professional standards. That battalion chief will create an adjudication report, and that report is uh, provided, let's just say it's going to be sustained. The charter allows the fire department to suspend and to terminate and that's it. So we cannot, um, and even a written reprimand is not considered punitive discipline within the charter. And there's some differences between the Bill of Rights and the charter. And so we, oftentimes we have to navigate between both um, uh, legislative uh, requirements. So because I'm, like for an example, under the Bill of Rights, a reprimand is punitive discipline. And so, so we navigate that as well. Um, so all the complaints that are received, um, are processed and investigated. We have heard complaints that people are unwilling to submit a complaint in fear of retaliation for their actions to report. Um, after every interview for any case, we uh, advise the witness or the subject that if they're subject to any kind of retaliation, we ask them to report that immediately to the department so we can follow up with those investigations as well. Everything that is reported gets investigated. Um, it's an equitable process, but it does require that we know what the complaint is so that we can follow up. Um, the, the other part of that is we also accept cases that are anonymous. So oftentimes we have an anonymous source complaint. We will follow up on that complaint to the best of our ability um, until we run out of leads. Um, and then, you know, we, we go from there. So we try to make the availability of CTS and PSD as available as possible for the public and for our members, um, because that's the only way we're really going to um, make our department better uh, is to get, a, get ahead of these disciplinary complaints. In addition to law enforcement agencies for criminal cases, we will refer cases to the city's um, uh, EEO division, um, FIHA, other agencies that do investigations. Sometimes it's DMV, sometimes it's the Emergency Medical Services Authority at the state level for paramedic type of cases. So we have a, a group of referrals that may come into play depending on what the investigation deals with. Um, and we have a referral process for that. So within the report, uh, it does provide some of the process that's contained in the charter. It includes going through pre-disciplinary hearings, which are Skelly hearings, prior to um, providing a suspension and also for board of rights hearings. And there is discussion in there about settlements and some other things in there. And mediation is something that we started to do at PSD as well. But I do want to draw your attention to some of the statistics. Complaint tracking system was developed in 2008 by ITA. And it's designed as a database for us to track our complaints, but it's not really designed to provide reports. And so since then, we've been trying to upgrade our complaint tracking system. And until then, we've been doing manual reporting as best we can as we pull some of this information out. Um, Deborah, I just want to remind everybody, we're now in 2022-21. It's going to be 2022 uh, shortly. So 2008 in technology is about as outdated as it can get. Yes, ma'am. So when you tell me that, uh, that the system, because I agree, no doubt that's something that ITA designed in 2008 was probably woefully insufficient for uh, the technology age of how we need to report, maintain security and privacy uh, for the integrity of these investigations. So what uh, I'm going to cut you off right now really quickly to ask, what is the actual plan 
to uh, to develop to have a new system put in place for the protection of the individuals that are uh, reporting. Uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. That's uh, we have budgeted. We have had budgeted items over the last few years to get CTS 2.0, if you will, up and running. Um, that program is being developed at we, as we speak. We're looking at off-the-shelf products, but also uh, homegrown products that will serve our needs. Our ITB, our IT Bureau, is working with ITA and looking at what the best solution will be that will also communicate with other com um, systems within our uh, platform of uh, you know, IT products that we have in the fire department. Because right now, it's um, it is like you say, it's in 2008. It didn't it doesn't really speak to anything else other than uh, the the intended use. So we are looking to upgrade that, and we have been looking at upgrading that for several years now. Um, is there a reason why we wouldn't even look to whatever the police department uses or personnel, given that we're trying to assure uh, compliance, protection of uh, of victims, and uh, security of this information? Yeah, so we, we've looked at their program as well and their team's program and some of the other ones the city attorney's office is using as well. So those are all on the table and I think components of that will be used because we do need it to communicate with other parts of our platform in order for it to be effective. But those are definitely on the table, yes. All right, so my apologies, continue. Oh, yes, ma'am. So uh, a little bit about the stats. Um, we went through and took a look at sustained cases that are both sustained punitive and sustained non-punitive from the opening of the doors until uh, June of 2021. And uh, we did that for gender and also ethnicity um, and as we broke out the numbers. And there wasn't really any particular cases that stuck out, stuck out in terms of the numbers, but one, one thing that drew my attention, in 2013, there was a philosophy, uh, when PSD opened up, the department philosophy was very punitive in nature. And as we studied more and we learned more about other agencies and what other administrative uh, agencies were doing across the country, law enforcement, we were really one of the first fire services to adopt such a robust um, division. So we kind of had to look at law enforcement more than fire service, but we looked at everything we could in the public sector. So some of the uh, work that was going on basically in 2013 was kind of a push more to a, a training and educational based discipline model um, and you can see that reflected in the numbers in 2013. We go from um, 68 cases in 2013 of sustained punitive, which would have been a suspension or potentially a termination. And we had 114 uh, non-discipline or non-punitive cases, which means the case was sustained, but we provided training and some educational-based discipline components to try to remedy that behavior because those employees for these minor offenses they're gonna spend 30 years as department employees and we wanna make sure that we get them trained to the, the proper level. Now, these are not the cases that are egregious in nature. Those cases are going to a board of rights. They are minor in nature. Um, but when we have the opportunity to provide training, uh, we will take that opportunity to hopefully correct that behavior and, uh, and you know, maintain our mission. Um, and, you know, that's in comparison to for instance, in 2011, we had 101 sustained cases that were punitive and our non-punitive cases were at 64. Um, so we broke those numbers down. And the other thing that's in the report that I wanted to draw your attention to is there's a footnote with how many cases we receive on an annual basis. And I didn't, I didn't wanna break out those numbers um, looking at ethnicity or gender. And I'll tell you the reason why is um, as we receive cases or complaints from the public or internally, um, we don't control who sends a complaint in. So I can't, I can't comment on any biases that might occur as a complaint comes in the door. What I can do is show the numbers of sustained cases and the actions the department took to respond to uh, whether or not the department has a bias in terms of its in terms of its adjudication of the investigations. But on the front side we get everything that comes in. And so when you look at the numbers themselves. It was um, a, the, the actual happened. the actual question was uh, related to the victims. So it was actually to, are, are you suggesting that these numbers were uh, identifying the complainants or the, or the, uh, the perpetrators? So the, 
the numbers on the sustained side are cases that may have multiple complainants, but they're cases. Uh, so these numbers are case numbers that come through the system. And some, some of these cases have multiple um, uh, subject members uh, that are, you know, disciplined, and some have multiple complainants. It just, it's kind of variable. It depends on the complaint. But these, that's why we use the case numbers as kind of the numbers that we look at benchmarks. So in 2016, in the footnote on, on uh, page three, it talks about the different numbers of cases that came into PSD. When, my first year there in 2008, we had 1,200 cases. Um, in 2016, went to 441. 2017, 400. 2018, we had 45. Those numbers stayed pretty consistent until we got to 2020. In 2020, we, we realized an uptick in complaints to 564 complaints. And again, these are all over the map in terms of egregiousness and, and behavior. Um, we account a lot of those cases in 2020. We received a lot of complaints uh, regarding COVID procedures and why our members were not wearing uh, PPE in certain cases or didn't go to certain hospitals and things like that. Our procedures changed in the field in 2020 quite a bit. Um, to date, June of 21, we were at 217. And if I extrapolate that out, we're right on that number, about 400 and 430 right in there. So on average, if you include 2020, on average, we average about 460 cases a year. And to give some context as to what we're receiving. And a little further context, and, and we receive complaints internally and externally. We respond on about a half million calls a year. So we have public contact at least 500,000 times a year, roughly. And we have internal customers as well in our work environments. And these members are working together for 24 hours on different occasions, different fire stations, and it's a very unique work environment. So given that, and the fact that we've had on average about 460 complaints, and not all of them are very, um, a lot, some of them are lost equipment, but some of them are very egregious and we take those very, very seriously. But just to give us some context, that's, I mean, a very small number of our public contacts or our internal contacts with each other result in a complaint against the, uh, against a member. So a lot of times these are um, uh, items that are uh, shown in the numbers not to be overly uh, large numbers in terms of complaints. Although we don't have zero, which is the really ideal, which is what we want, but we're not satisfied with those numbers and we'll continue to work hard to reduce those numbers through training and other methods. Um, but I just wanted to give you a little context on the number of complaints we receive on an annual basis versus the number of public contacts and the number of internal contacts, the potential for, for complaints. So well, I guess, I guess my question is, and, and, you know, our concern, and I can appreciate the, the, the fact that you've actually distilled that there's a difference between the external, uh, complaint driven as well. Uh, but we really want to also be introspective about the number of complaints that are being generated in house. You know, uh, that, that's really what we're trying to, to uh, help get to is, you know, distilling what the number is of individuals and the numbers of complaints uh, associated with uh, more interdepartmental uh, concerns. So is your is the uh, CTS system unable to decipher the difference between the two or are yeah. you tracking that? Yeah, so that's one of the reporting um, issues that we've had in the past. Part of the process is if you're a citizen and you go to your fire station and knock on the door and you say, I have a complaint, that captain's direction is to put the complaint in the system for the member, for the citizen, or they can direct the citizen to do so from their home computer. But normally when, when, when citizens will knock on the door and want to file a complaint, the captain will log that. So that shows up as an internal complaint. Um, and so there isn't a good way to weed those numbers out with this system. We can do it manually, but it's one of those things where we have to go through the comment section to see if it's an internal complaint or an external complaint truly. So, ma'am, that's uh, that's really the conclusion of what I had for you, and I'm open to answer any other questions that if I can. Uh, 
Thank you. Well, I think what you've what you've helped me identify is exactly what I think will be probably one of your largest budgetary priorities when we go to budget uh, in the uh, coming year, uh, because the data is a very substantial uh, tool uh, to helping us address what some of the root causes might be uh, before they actually become a bigger problem. And being able to ascertain the difference between complaints that are generated in-house versus uh, from the public should be something that's very easy to distill uh, and aggregate from your complaint system. But given that it was developed in 2008, that's already part of the biggest problem among, I think, what needs to be refined uh, in this process going forward. So, you know, obviously what we've seen is a trajectory of numbers that have increased. It hasn't decreased, uh, particularly in the last, looking at the data for the last couple of years. Uh, or the last year and a half, two years. So can you just kind of give me an understanding of the professional standards division's ability to what their, what their capacity is and timeline uh, to complete an investigation? And, uh, you know, are there any problems with statute of limitations and then not fulfilling that given whatever staffing or uh, time is required for them to conduct their investigations? Yes, ma'am. So. Um the staff there has quite a few cases. They're very busy. A lot of them are carrying 30 cases uh, as their caseload. Um, the, in terms of the report back, so real quick, on the definitions of the statutes. In the charter, the statute of limitations is that the department has one year from the date of discovery and in no case longer than two years from the date of occurrence to complete a case. In the Bill of Rights, it's different. It's one year from the date of discovery, and there's no cap. So what PSD is challenged to do is to complete these investigations um, in a timely manner, obviously, because we do not want cases to go out of statute. Some of the issues that we have with statute is our date of discovery is oftentimes given to us six months into a case, eight months into a case. And so that statute clock is ticking um, by the time we get to that date of occurrence clock. So sometimes we'll get a case and we're not, we didn't discover it, legally discover it until 11 months have gone by. And so we're scrambling to meet that two year mark under the charter, even though the bill of rights allows us not to have it. So we've tried to kind of bring the charter and the bill of rights together. Um, however, Back in 09, um, it, it wasn't going to be an option. Um, so, because it was a charter amendment and it wasn't going to happen. So, um, so we work between the two lines. Um, but the internal policy for PSD is to create uh, the, the investigative report at a six month mark. And that gives time for the adjudicator to complete the adjudication and to complete the paperwork required for a Skelly hearing and all that. The, stop, the clock stops when we serve the member following the skelly with the second half skelly paperwork, and uh, that's when the clock is stopped. So uh, statute is always on our minds, and um, we sometimes it's hard to get to depending on when we get the case, but that is probably the number one priority is that cases do not go out of statute. So uh, do you have a number roughly given the Increase of complaints that have been of complaints that have been received. How many have been investigated thus far uh, that will that will be able to be completed in the time and fashion necessary versus those that are going to be falling out? Uh, I can provide numbers that have fallen out um, more readily than I can provide numbers that aren't going to fall. Like uh, cases that are in progress. Uh, those cases always change. There's another interview to do or more evidence comes in or something like that. So it's hard to say uh, we have a ballpark of when it's going to be done, but it's easier to show we had this many cases come in and we had this many cases fall out of statute. And when they fall out of statute, again, there's many factors for that. Sometimes it's like we don't get it the first day it happened. So we don't have a full calendar of, of statute time to work on. So um, that's where staffing comes in. Oftentimes we will detail members that have previously worked in an investigative role to complete some cases for us and help us um, because the staff, and we are getting uh, 
three of our investigator positions filled um, that we've interviewed for at least two of them. I know we've interviewed four and they should be starting very soon. Due to the hiring freeze, we were not able to hire until just recently, but we've conducted interviews for some civilian investigators. They'll be coming on board shortly, so that'll help as well. Um, so yeah, we're always looking for um, uh, caseload relief for our uh, advocates and our civilian investigators there. And uh, how many of the cases have gone through that community mediation partnership program? And what are the metrics associated uh, with that? So we've had a few, we've had success with the few. I think the number is less than 10. I don't have the exact number, but we've been working with the USC uh, group in that endeavor. And it's been a good pilot program. We're going to continue to expand it. Um, and that's, that's been a good partnership. The problem, the issue that we've been coming up with is when both parties don't want to participate. Like we'll have one party that's very eager to participate, the department's willing to do it, but the other party won't. So um, on the few, on the rare occasions, I think we've had about a half dozen, six, six different cases that we've had some experience with that. And from those six cases that have participated, it's been pretty successful. Okay. Um, I have uh, two colleagues that have their hands up. I know Mr. Peretz and then uh, Mr. Hedgebosser. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think most of my questions have been answered and one not not entirely clear. Um, does, does LAFD currently need additional staffing for the Professional Standards Division to actually do all this properly? It, it sounds like uh, people have pr pretty heavy caseloads and uh, you probably could use some assistance. So how much how much help, if any, do you need additionally to be budgeted to make this work properly? Yes, sir. So uh, we haven't put together a staffing report on what we need. We, we definitely could use the bodies. Uh, we've been making it work, and we do have these two people coming on board now. But in our budget package, um, we do have a, a professional standards piece in there that is a pay grade advancement for one of our existing civilian investigators to create a board of rights section. We anticipate um, uh, right now, and, and I'll get back into it. So the board of rights is a process that has twofold. One is it's an appeal process for members to appeal their suspension. On the other hand, if the department finds the discipline requires a suspension greater than 30 days, we will direct someone to a board of rights. So there's two ways to go to a board of rights. Oftentimes, what we find is members that receive a suspension will, re will request, which is their right, they'll request a board of rights. So what we want to do is create um, a section that handles the boards of rights so we can do those more timely and get those off the docket. Um, oftentimes, that's a big chokehold on, on moving forward progression-wise. So we do have something in this year's budget to upgrade a position um, for a board of rights section. Uh, or border rights um, lead. And then uh, in future budgets, we probably will be asking for additional staff once we do a staff report on what exactly the needs were. Um, going back again a long time ago, we had, um, when they created PSD, they asked how many cases does operations handle per year? And at that time they said 100. Well, like I said, my first year there, we did 1,200. And we had the same staffing model that was geared for 100. So we were constantly pulling from everywhere to get people on board. It's more robust now, but and the caseloads are down compared to that, but we could always use additional bodies. I just don't have the exact number of bodies we need, but we can definitely put that together for a future package. Well, hopefully we staff this up so we can do it right. Thank you, sir. That's all I've got, Madam Chair, thank you. Awesome. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I couldn't uh, hear you uh, earlier. I just wanted to uh, just delve a little bit more into the uh, issue that you raised about technology, uh, Mr. Everett, and the ability to analyze trends uh, and the ability to have the, you know, um, the aggregation of data so you'll know like, oh, new officers in these neighborhoods tend to have challenges or Officers where there three women have less problems than office than houses with 
two women, or I don't know what it could be. But the point is, if you don't have a system that aggregates that data and lets you do analysis, you can't do it. So I'm wondering how you all think about uh, that opportunity uh, to improve the environment, improve the work, and, and remove this as an impediment to uh, productivity. Yes, sir. That's, that's really the number one priority for the new system. We have a system that will track complaints. We don't really need, you know, it's not that big an upgrade. We need a system that can track and not necessarily, so we can do an analysis based on the data it provides. Um, the, the examples that you used are very similar to the ones that we are querying about manually. Um, we want to see where those fire stations are, where supervisors may need additional training or where issues are occurring. And just anecdotally, when I was there, there were fire stations where you just knew, hey, this one came up through this station. And it, it all boils back down to the supervisors and who's running that work location. So if we have more informed information coming through, we could definitely make some um, moves in terms of training, discipline, uh, all the other things that come with it to get that work environment right. And that's ultimately the goal is, you know, to correct behavior and to maintain public trust. That's PSD's mission. And so when they have the tools to complete that, it makes it a little easier. But it, it, it is difficult to, to study um, the trends. And um, I mean, it goes back to when economic times were hard and, you know, back in the recession. And I was actually there at PSD. Some of the, the folks that used to work in the discipline realm would tell me, hey, look, when the economic times get bad, you're going to get some DUIs and you're going to get some domestic violence cases. It's just the way it is. And that's the way it was. But there was no way to really track that. It was all anecdotal information. So I, I've always wanted a system that will do that and speak to it, you know. And so we're definitely working in that direction with this new system. That's really the priority is to have the ability to draw data from it. Well, you know, thank you for that. I think it's, you know, this city uh, has been a leader in this. Uh, you know, our police department is frankly one of the most significant things they've done in the last 20 years is the aggregation of data and the, the ability to be able to predict where there are going to be problems. You know, they know on Super Bowl Sunday at about this time, you know, be ready because these calls, these are the kinds of calls that are likely to come in. And I think, you know, to the extent we can employ those lessons uh, in a place, especially like the fire department, because I think we have such opportunity and such goodwill in the public that we don't want to squander uh, by not dealing with the problems that we know are before us in the best possible way we can. So thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Everett, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, thank you, Mr. Gerstassen. And, you know, and this is precisely why we needed to have this conversation because, uh, you know, we've also, uh, suggested recently, it was also you know, on a separate, similar but separate matter that precipitated this in the access to the system uh, during the investigation as well. And could be potentially problematic. So, making sure that there is a secured uh, network that victims can trust and that the department can ascertain the correct information, the aggregate information, I think is also going to be an important tool uh, for. Uh, Sure that we both represent the very best of this department and hold accountable those that uh, might require uh, any additional So, with that, uh, colleagues, uh, Mr. Bustano, did you have any questions? Okay. Um, so, uh, Mr. Kratz, are you back? Because I need your hands still. Sorry, left my hand up. Nothing else to ask. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Everett. I appreciate it. And uh, colleagues, with that, I'd like to recommend that we know the file. And uh, very much. So, uh, Mr. Clerk, I believe that clears the dust. Uh, that clears the dust, Madam Chair. So much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Take care. That concludes our meeting.